Second, secondly, approve uh, public lecture in the science society and make it serious. Professor Deepak Kumar Jawala named the University, Science Religion and Society, Civil from Colonial India. 23rd, um, BC seminar, Professor Sunil Kumar, University of Delhi. Deep structures, the capital of the Sultans and the Riverine Plain of Delhi. And between the 26th and the 27th, there was a conference in association with Professor Niladi Bhattacharya, uh, JNU, uh, um, Dr. Rashmi Khan, uh, fellow Nehru and Museum, Professor Jalati Nara, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Thinking through the law, South Asian um, history, the medieval archives. So that's the uh, announcement for this week. Um, I'm sure everybody's delighted that. Shabira, who never comes easily to any place, just to beg and plead and so on, because you get her, her uh, she's over consumed, but for good reason, because she's a conscientious teacher. So, that's good. So, we are delighted to have her here, and uh, without any, all of you know her work. Um, and today, as, uh, as part of the work that she's been doing, engaged with for the last coming years, she will be speaking on reading. We are a worker in the university, reflection on communities of meaning in Africa on this theory. So, Shabina, yes. Uh, I think cell phones, so please fix them off. I am just for solid public reasons. Thank you, Uma, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, truly a privilege to be speaking here on reading Dr. B.R. Ambedkar in the university and reflecting on diverse communities of meaning and questions for anti caste feminist theory. Uh, I'll try uh, as briefly as possible to put forth ideas and maybe uh, leave a large part for the discussion. Uh, to begin with, reading of the B.R. Ambedkar in the university really, in a sense, quote-unquote, for sociology, political science, or cultural studies, began to gather momentum only in the 1990s and largely due to the efforts of Dalit scholars to integrate the writings of Ambedkar in the curricula. But feminist debate and curricula remain largely disengaged from the writings and politics of Ambedkar. Given actually the well-established linkages between the feminist political and intellectual projects, one would have expected many projects rewriting histories of caste and gender to have emerged in the aftermath of Mandal or the that is feminist assertions both at the national and the regional level. Uh, no doubt, uh, several uh, feminist scholars felt the imperative to encast gender or engender histories of caste and Uma's formulation of very significant formulation of Brahmanical patriarchy, in fact, uh, took shape within this context. But having said that, we are still, in a sense, wanting in a engaged debate on this concept uh, in terms of this historical and cultural manifestation. And given the cult of pluralism in feminist studies, uh, in the absence of a debate, we seem to have comfortably settled into uh, a peaceful coexistence between those of us who do caste and those who don't, as if doing caste were a matter of choice for anyone doing gender. Uh, in a sense, while some Dalit Bahujan male scholars have focused more on the difference of Dalit Bahujan patriarchy, locating it in quote unquote more democratic practices, uh, feminist scholars by and large have focus more on the sameness of patriarchy. To put it, to put it briefly, the problem for anti-caste feminist theory is really to move beyond the binaries of sameness and difference and or uh, merely pluralizing the term patriarchy to reclaim the theoretical legacy of the Aramvedka, which saw caste and gender as entangled but never easily equated. What I'm suggesting in my presentation today is such a turn to reclaim the writings of Ambedkar as classic, feminist classic for anti-caste feminist theory would require a turn 
to new sources and methods for interpreting Ambedkar for his time and hour. More specifically, what I am suggesting is that a feminist Ambedkar is reclaimed outside the academia, most uh, particularly in the music and booklet uh, public that is public in Maharashtra. And it is an encounter with this booklet and music culture of the Ambedkarites in Maharashtra that allows one to interrogate what I am calling the paradox of the feminist denial of Ambedkar's political contribution. To explain what I mean by the paradox of the feminist denial of Ambedkar, allow me to quote briefly from Urmila Pawar's life narrative, I Dan, or the Weave of My Life. Urmila Pawar recalling a feminist seminar at a reputed institute in Bombay tells us about how a feminist scholar confidently claimed in the seminar, and I quote, Ambedkar did nothing for women, the Hindu court bill is the political stunt. Unlike Phule, he did not even educate his wife. Pawar mentions being shocked more not in the statement but at the silence that followed and at the sheer trivialization of what she said was a serious issue of the different reconstitution of personal sphere in diverse social locations. Pawar's narrative actually draws attention to one of the most common or typical ways in which the feminist discourse, at least in Maharashtra for long, has denied the political contribution of Ambedkar by selectively referring to the personal sphere. So following uh, Urmila Pawar, there are two issues that I think we need to address here. One, to interrogate this paradox of the feminist denial of Ambedkar based on the selective and erroneous reading of the personal sphere. And two, to open up to discussion how the Ambedkarite public sought to reconstitute the personal sphere. Historically, if we quickly recall how the privileged caste in constituting the uh, colonial public sphere, while disavowing caste in public, brought together or patched together ideas of new ideas of individualism with endogamy or Varna Ashrama Dharma with ideas of division of labor to claim universal modernity. Feminist scholarship has demonstrated convincingly how this middle class public sphere reconstituted the personal, most notably in uh, inventing the model of companionate marriage. Clearly, non dalit feminists including myself, has seen the absence of this companionist, uh, model of companionist marriage in a baker's life as him privileging community over wife and by extension women's own issue and for that reason not feminist enough. In contrast to the middle class public sphere, a maker is seeking a rational re-examination of the core values that constitute uh, into metaphysics redefined gender and caste codes, producing more radical meanings of modernity. While we have a good amount of scholarship now on how uh, on this public modernity or even that is women's agency in the making of this public modernity, we have yet not fully engaged with the question of how these publics, the American public, reconstituted the personal sphere. For instance, what did the challenge to Brahmanical Hinduism do to kinship relations, the household, or the relationship between the household, the political community, and conjugality. Voluminous biographies and musical compositions that continue to illuminate uh, the life and politics of a maker serve as a very important resource to pursue some of these questions. And I'd like to begin with just these two images drawn from the rich visual uh, history of the Ambedkar public. The first as uh, is a garden, is a family photograph uh, taken definitely on a special occasion, and the other a popular poster which imagines a very grand wedding reception for uh, Ambedkar and Ramabai when we know for a fact that the wedding was performed hurriedly in the Balkala vegetable market. Uh, the family photograph, as we know, uh, helps to 
remember that extraordinary men also are invested in the ordinary of the household, but it doesn't tell us much what uh, it, it's TV Paramore's 12 volume biography of Ambedkar that actually gives us accounts ranging from uh, tensions over the domestic budget caused by Ambedkar's uh, buying of books to very poignant accounts of uh, his inconsolable grief on the death of Ramabai and his reflections on how uh, he had neglected both the health of Ramabai and their son Yashwara. Uh, what catches attention in this 12 volume biography is in volume 2, titles of two chapters. My one chapter is called uh, Ramabai Sa Sonsar, the household of Ramabai. The other is called Nava Sonsar, the new household. A reading of these two chapters really tells us how Ramabai's household expanded to encompass the entire political community. If within that context, if we turn to the popular books, where we see Ambedkar seems to have brought a book to his own wedding reception, and Ramabai does not look, uh, this person looks quite happy uh, with the book coming to the wedding reception. What does this book signify? Is it the constitution he was to write? Does it symbolize the now, his love for books? Or is, is it registering Ramabai's immense sacrifice in selling a jewellery to make possible Rajguru home for Ambedkar's ever-growing collection of books? Whichever way we may choose to read this poster, it definitely uh, underlines the inseparability of the conjugal, the political and the intellectual. In a sense, popular imagination escapes all the strains of time and space in imagining this grand reception and both the Buddha and the constitution before their time. But what it does in, uh, uh, in doing so is it registers Ramabai's contribution to Ambedkar's political work, be it the constitution or be it Dharmantar, which came decades after her death. In a sense, this is a theme that is repeated over and over again in the booklets and the music that continue to be produced every year on Ramabai. Most of these, uh, in many ways, highlight her as Ramai, the mother of uh, the entire Dalit community, and map major events in her life, marking her uniqueness as extraordinary. Though nowhere matched in number, there are a good number of booklets on uh, my type of uh, Sabina Bai Ambedkar, uh, or Dr. Sharda Kabir, the Brahmin medical doctor that Ambedkar married 13 years after the death of Ramabai. These booklets are steeped in suspicion and doubt, and in many ways, some of them declare uh, Savita Bai Ambedkar as a betrayer, some even label her a murderer. Those that come after 2003, after her death, seek a rational re-examination of her role in Ambedkar's life. So, uh, I'd very quickly like to uh, draw your attention to uh, some major issues that emerged from the representation or representation of uh, uh, Ramabai in the booklet and musical composition. Firstly, what is striking is that representations of Ramabai never represent her as an inherently self-sacrificing wife and mother. In fact, what is highlighted is the transition from Ram, Rami, the orphan girl from Baker Valley, to Ramai, the mother of a political community, highlighting her early expectations of Ambedkar to be a normative householder, her anger at coming to know of this political and educational aspiration, but her eventual extraordinary support uh, is highlighted in the compositions through her very dignified negotiations with poverty and refusal of charity. A second issue that comes through in these representations is that the relation between Ambedkar and Ramabai unfolds through disagreement and dialogue, uh, especially on the matter of the refusal to educate uh, herself and Ambedkar's intense anger at this and Ramabai and Ambedkar giving up conversation uh, for days on end is a repeated theme in many of these uh, compositions. A third issue that comes through in these representations is uh, that Ramabai's extraordinary support 
Dr. Ambedkar comes no doubt from her dedication, love and admiration for an extraordinary man. But hers is not a mindless following is what each of these representations tell us. For they map a growing curiosity and interest in his political work, starting with the Mankao Parishad through Mahar to uh, really her leading a meeting at the JJ uh, Hospital grounds in Bombay and finally actually uh, organizing and leading an interlining event for uh, uh, women of extra judgment community. So in a sense, what is highlighted is her growing political curiosity and conviction and not a mindless following of Ambedkar. In contrast, if we look at the representations of Sagitabai, and I'm looking here at those that seek a rational re-examination of her role, they all highlight the individualized nature of the relationship with Ambedkar, a relation that refuses to see building bridges with the household and the political community as uh, crucial or central to conjugality that brings rejection from the community. So it's really the refusal to build bridges that brings rejection from the community, how these booklets represent uh, Sarudabai. Uh, clearly, what we uh, have here are two contrasting the representations of Ramabai and Savitabai, who before us two contrasting models of companionate marriage and a critique of the dominant middle class model of companionate marriage. In fact, some of the songs composed by women during Ambedkar's lifetime seem to even try to reconcile these two models in uh, imagining that Ramabai and Savitabai is in the same place for the love of Bhima. Or, uh, for instance, uh, one of the songs imagining uh, uh, Ramabai giving Savitabai advice on how she could conduct herself so that the political work of Ambedkar may not be disturbed. The point I'm trying to underline through these representations is really that unlike in the feminist discourse, where the personal sphere of Ambedkar was as if a series of self-evident truths of whether he educated his wife or not, for the Dalit public, again conflicting pressures to claim both selfhood and community, the personal sphere of Ambedkar, the household, the history of the Ambedkar household, become models, dynamic resources for making and remaking public and private sense. And in a sense, uh, it is within this uh, discourse of the music and the booklet culture of the uh, Ambedkarite that a debate on Ambedkar on the women's question first begins. The booklet and music that I have been speaking about actually circulate in the event uh, or the spaces that are constituted by the Ambedkarite Almanac. Uh, events that in middle class common sense have been interpreted often as uh, irrational, emotional, or also as events that cause public nuisance. And unexpectedly, as these are interpretations that resonate with those of social sciences, because barring a few notable exceptions, most social sciences have also seen this be public as irrational deification of Ambedkar or uh, at best manipulation of Dalit masses by the Dalit leadership. Our documentation of these uh, public events over the last 10 years suggests otherwise. It suggests the presence of Dalit counterparties that are constituted to oppositional claims uh, articulated in the booklets and music which circulate in alternate institutional circuits. In many ways, the first uh, debate within these Dalit public on Ambedkar and Sri Mukti or Ambedkar and the liberation of women began to gather shape in the mid 1990s and one of the first booklets that emerges actually uh, interrogates not only the dominant public but also the left the feminist, socialist, and that is made uh, from the public for what is, uh, is called this constancy of silence on this theme. It asks why when during the Ambedkar centenary years, publications of all themes under the sun emerged, why, was, uh, why were there no publications on Ambedkar or the women's question? The, the booklet then goes on to map 
the importance of essays like Castes in India and uh, uh, the rise and fall of Hindu women for uh, women for actually rethinking the theory and practice of women's liberation in India. Uh, following this booklet, this booklet also highlights the importance of the Hindu court base, the debate on the Hindu court base as a manifest, the first manifesto of women's liberation in independent India and goes on to document Ambedkar's resignation in protest as an act unparalleled in history. There are several booklets that follow soon after this, which highlight largely the text Rise and Fall of Hindu Women, uh, underlining its significance for an alternative, alternate reading of history. There are several others that uh, highlight Ambedkar's role as labor minister in drafting the Mines Maternity Benefits Act or equal representation for women in the coal mines welfare board or also suggesting uh, the importance of equal rights and citizenship that he uh, drafted. Yet others highlight the role he played in institutionalizing women's uh, participation in the public sphere, whether it was through the Mahila Sabhas that were organized alongside the meetings of the Independent Labour Party or later to the constitution of the Dalit Mahila Federation. If uh, these booklets, in a sense, draw from Ambedkar's writings and speeches to put forth rational critical arguments, a dimension of social imagination is seen in the musical compositions that emerge during the same period, a lot of music during this time uh, begins to imagine a uh, different history of uh, Ambedkar setting the Manus Murthy to flame uh, at Mahar, uh, underlining how this was in protest against the degradation of women. Several booklets, uh, several music, sorry, several musical cassettes called, uh, interestingly called, uh, Jaydeem Mara Naura Bhaiwe, Walter Suri Ambedkar's uh, husband, imagine, uh, 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 imagine uh, women asking Ambedkar uh, to advise them on how to reform their men into becoming truly Ambedkar's husband, or even uh, 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 several songs in the Buddhist Maila Geet genre, which imagine Dhimpari, a utopia, uh, of Ambedkarite women, uh, ID uh, Ambedkarite village. Uh, in many ways, therefore, an inquiry on uh, that I set out with to reclaim some of Ambedkar's writing and speeches as feminist classics, to me could have not begun anywhere else. It could not have begun in the academia. It had to begin within the music and booklet culture of uh, the Ambedkarite because it is through listening to these counter publics that one could draw what could be called a first possible list of essential readings uh, for feminists uh, drawing from Ambedkar's uh, writings and uh, speeches. And what I suggest uh, as essential readings for feminists uh, really comes in three sets. A first set constituted by the essay Cast in India. Uh, they are uh, mechanisms, Genesis and Development, uh, essay published in 1970, to be read intersectionally with The Rise and Fall of Hindu uh, Women, published in 1951. Uh, this together, in a sense, put uh, out Ambedkar's formulation on how exclusionary violence of caste and violence against uh, women are inherent in the processes of caste formation. A second text that draws upon uh, riddles in Hinduism, 24 riddles that Ambedkar uh, put forth, uh, which were published posthumously, um, and I focus largely on riddle number 18 and 19, and on the riddle of women, which was published in the volume as uh, Women and Counter Revolution, but which in Ambedkar's note is also titled as um, uh, the uh, riddle of women and uh, the controversial uh, riddles of Ram and Krishna, which came as appendix to the volume uh, on uh, riddles. These read together, in a sense, put out Ambedkar's formulation on uh, how and why, why gender violence bears a graded character. Uh, and the first set, which I will not uh, speak on the theme for um, a discussion, is the debate around the Hindu code base 
and his statement uh, issued out by Ambedkar uh, to explain his resignation uh, as Lord Minister, uh, which in a sense, this set together allowed us to understand what was his agenda for uh, democratization of the personal sphere and in many ways also understand uh, the logics and strategies that he used to counter what was called in those times uh, the unfettered, uh, the manifesto for unfettered freedom uh, for women in India by all the opponents of the Hindu gold days. Uh, so I would leave that to discussion that uh, uh, look largely at the first two uh, sets of uh, writings of Ambedkar. Beginning with uh, castes in India, in this essay written as a part of the anthropology seminar at Columbia, uh, Ambedkar undertakes a critique of the essentialization of caste and seeks to uh, establish it as knowable both practically and theoretically. In a sense, in contrast to the anthropological equation of caste today, the question for Ambedkar in this essay is how do a racially mixed and culturally homogeneous uh, people become parceled into fixed units? And uh, in a sense, he undertakes first a review of the major theories of his time, faulting most of them for focusing on uh, caste as jati or isolated units, thereby leading to misdiagnosis of symptoms of caste as causes of the caste system. And uh, then uh, upholds uh, ethnic experts characterization of caste, mainly the two characteristics uh, given by ethnic Ekkar, uh, the, the, the prohibitions on intermarriage and membership by autogeny. Ambedkar takes this further to argue that what are for ethnic Ekkar two characteristics of caste are in fact two sides of the same coin and therefore establishes endogamy as essential uh, to the caste system and through the essay in a sense uh, works out how endogamy sustains different uh, mechanisms uh, that build or develop a structure which we recognize as the caste system. He begins the discussion with really uh, nothing how endogamy comes to be superimposed on exogamy, thereby saying that the most practical question uh, for uh, uh, for anyone interested in the caste system is to ask how is the marriage circle formed or how is the parity between marriageable units maintained. And then by placing caste within uh, a discussion on differential rules for the disposal of uh, surplus men and women, he really in a sense puts forth arguably the first feminist take on caste. What he goes on to show is how surplus women are disposed either by burning them on the fire of the deceased husband or through enforced and degraded widowhood. But given the male superiority across all groups, surplus men are managed, however, by institutionalizing the practice of marriage with girl children. He then goes on to show uh, how uh, the double man uh, maneuver uh, of Brahmanical ideology operates, in that Brahmanical ideology both utilizes and maintains the degradation of women. So in a sense, to put it briefly, there are three operations uh, uh, which for America, in a sense, uh, go into the formation of caste. One is the intra-group organization of reproduction, violent control on the sexuality of women, and legitimation of these violent controls to ideology. In a sense, noting in this essay that he is postponing a historical detailing for another time, he goes on to maintain that caste is enclosed class and that the Brahmins were the first class to raise the walls of endogamy, with non brahmins emulating but not in total. Following caste law of imitation, he goes on to detail how imitation flows from higher levels to lower
lower levels. Uh, with the practices of imitation uh, varying in inversely in proportion to the distance from the glasses. In many ways, uh, in a sense, what he is arguing in this discussion is the way in which the normalization of violence against women has led to caste being regarded as born and not made, and therefore exclusionary violence of caste to be seen as a symptom rather than a cause of the caste system. And therefore what he really uh, establishes through this essay is how the exclusionary violence of caste and violence against women are inherent in the very processes of caste formation. Scholars like Kalpana Tanavilan and Sister Jakilo have uh, had three generations of sociologists for disregarding uh, this counter hegemonic theory of caste. Kanavilan uh, goes a step further to in fact uh, uh, compare uh, the disregard for Ambedkar's theory of imitation as against the immense uh, popularity of the heuristic device of sanctification. And we may add here that why for the latter, uh, sanctification leads to quote unquote uh, some harsh conditions for women in the form of uh, violence against women is structural. Chapano, however, though he finds a flash of sociological uh, genius in Ambedkar's theory, finds the connection he makes with violence against women implausible. Uh, sociologist M. S. Kore also argues that Ambedkar's uh, theory of surplus man and woman falls through if one uh, recognizes the prevalence of polygamy. Uh, enough to note here that feminist scholarship, feminist historians in the last three decades have established how polygamy, sati, and widow, uh, enforced widowhood coexisted together. And also, if we uh, read these uh, criticisms in the light of the historical detailing of this theory that Ambedkar was to do later, both in the rise and fall of Hinduism and religion Hinduism, some of these criticisms might uh, look different. Turning to the rise and fall of uh, Hindu women, uh, this text when read uh, in the context of the larger body of Ambedkar's historical writings in the 1940s, and most particularly in, uh, the uh, search for the origin of the Shudras and search for the origin of the untouchables and his uh, writings uh, on revolution and counter-revolution, which sought an alternate periodization of history into the uh, Brahminic, the Buddhist, and the Hindu period, emerges as a classic enlightenment style text on the descent of status of uh, women. Uh, this is, uh, what I'm suggesting is given the continuity of uh, purpose and ideas in his historical writing, this text needs to be read in the larger context of his historical writings in the 40s and most particularly his uh, search for the origins of uh, the untouchables or his broken men theory. Uh, the essay, The Horizon World of uh, Hindu uh, Women, published in the journal Mahabodhi 1951, was written in response to an article that appeared in the ESBT which uh, faulted the Buddha for, uh, or uh, in a sense, blame the Buddha for uh, the uh, fall in status of Indian women. Ambedkar um, probably alluding to uh, the nationalist myth of the Vedic woman, uh, argues that there is a pattern in such indictment and uh, uh, this needs to be rationally refuted. Uh, and he takes on three specific allegations against the Buddha for the rational refutation. Uh, first, that the Buddha prohibited all interaction with women. Secondly, that he forbade Kalingraja uh, for women. And thirdly, when he allowed women entry into the Sangha, he subordinated the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the Sangha to the Bhikkhu Sangha. Uh, Ambedkar takes up each of these allegations and seeks to refute them, firstly by arguing uh, or drawing attention to the distortions that have uh, come in the process of codification of oral narratives. 
taking me by uh, drawing upon original textual evidence, uh, uh, Chinese text for example, and uh, thirdly uh, by uh, comparing uh, the Buddha's position on women with women's position in the pre-Buddha, uh, the Buddha and the post-Buddha period. Uh, what he underlines is, uh, or what he calls the critiques of the Buddha for mainly, is their failure to recognize the radical possibilities opened up by Palazaga, uh, arguing that uh, this was important in a society where Sanya had emerged as a Brahminic ID only to its denial to women and children. And uh, what he underlines is the fact that the Buddha did not place any premium on virginity, thereby opening up the Sangha for all categories of women, uh, a theme that he was to take up in much more detail in the Buddha and his Dhamma uh, later, but nevertheless uh, argued in uh, this uh, earlier text in 1951. In the latter part of the essay, he undertakes a comparison of the position of women in the pre Buddha, the Brahminic period, the Buddhist period, which is marked as the uh, period of revolution, and the uh, Hindu period, marked by the rise of Kushamutra Sangha and the law of Manu becoming law of the state, which is uh, the period of counter revolution. What he highlights in this section of the essay is the way in which ideal womanhood defined in terms of exaltation of the husband or the Bhattivrata ideology, uh, though a Brahminic ID becomes during this period, Manu's period, the law of the state, and then goes along with practices such as forbidding, but, uh, 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 forbidding funeral rites uh, to women who turn to be heretic sex or those who enter mixed union. What he highlights is, uh, uh, in his words, Manu adds insult to injury. Uh, so what Manu does to the Brahminic ideals, he says, is provide uh, uh, justification uh, on grounds of women, uh, what he details out as the intellectual, the spiritual, and the moral uh, inferiority of women. Uh, this text, in many ways, therefore, when read along with uh, the broken men theory, in which a maker traces the roots of untouchability uh, to uh, what he calls the defeated tribe, uh, refusing to give up Buddhism to the pressures of Brahminism. So, in a sense, when both these texts are read together, the broken men and uh, the women, uh, so if, if the leader of counter revolution, the Hindu leader brings imposition of untouchability on the broken men, for all women it brought about an immense unprecedented degradation uh, of their status and unprecedented regulations and controls. In many ways, therefore, to put it briefly, a method is suggesting that many, uh, that it is Manu who brings about, it is the, uh, not the Buddha, but the Manu, uh, but Manu who is to be blamed, and that much of this was a preemptive response uh, to the kind of freedom that was made, uh, that seemed possible for women and shudras under Buddhism. Uh, if sociologists have disregarded uh, Ambedkar's caste in India, in many ways uh, historians have completely ignored the text, uh, the rise and fall of Hinduism, and also a large body of his historical writing. Professor Rohila Thakkar in uh, commenting on why citations of Ambedkar are uh, maybe missing, uh, suggests that this might be uh, uh, because to him caste was not uh, just social hierarchy, but it was a system of subordination and domination. While this, one might argue, explains why mainstream historians might have ignored the writings of Ambedkar. It still does not tell us why Marxist and feminist historians did not turn uh, to be uh, text. Uh, Arun Sharma, for instance, does mention that Ambedkar is the only text one finds on uh, shudras in early uh, uh, India, but goes on quickly to disparage this text as uh, using only uh, resources in uh, translation, but more particularly for being political in content. 
uh, he sees this text as typical of texts written by quote unquote low caste educated men who wanted to claim a, uh, a, a higher status for uh, the Shunya. Uh, historians like Aluni have drawn our attention to how Sharma and Ambedkar seem to reach similar conclusions and therefore push us to think about the academic prejudice against a paper that has existed in history writing in India. In many ways, what I am suggesting therefore is to reclaim uh, these texts uh, as feminist classics in the uh, rich debate that we already have in feminist history on the myth of the lady uh, 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 woman, because in many ways this is one of the earliest texts to turn the myth of the Vedic woman on its head. And actually, uh, such a reclamation might open up a very interesting debate between Ambedkar's Buddha and varying positions that feminists have taken on whether Buddhism really uh, offers an alternative to Brahmanical patriarchy. If uh, in uh, the two texts that I've just discussed, Ambedkar was concerned with, uh, with, with endogamy as a strong uh, mode of social control. In religious uh, in Hinduism, he is more concerned with the violations of endogamy and the immense anxiety this uh, creates for the Brahmin lawgiver. Uh, in Riddle 18, in a sense, uh, what I am suggesting is that if in annihilation of caste, America has already established caste and system of graded inequality, in the digits that I am uh, presenting to you, uh, the 18, 19 and riddles of Ram and Krishna, Ambedkar is formulating how this uh, system of graded inequality is also a system of uh, graded violence, a uh, gender violence. In Riddle 18, uh, which, is, which uh, Ambedkar titles as Manu's Madness, or, uh, or the Brahminical explanation of the origin of mixed caste. Ambedkar takes us through the uh, list of categorization in the uh, Hindu law book or, uh, of different castes, uh, like the Aryan, non Aryan, Rastya, Kodan, Sankara caste, and through the sub categorization based on hypergamous and hypogamous uh, unions. Uh, to actually draw our attention to the anomalies that exist in the list drawn up by the different Brahmin uh, lawgivers. Uh, and he particularly draws attention to the numerical discrepancies in the listing as also uh, to, uh, the dis uh, to the disagreements, immense disagreements that exist between the different lawgivers on the origin of uh, the mixed caste. And most importantly, he draws attention to uh, the way in which Manu in his listing introduces the category of bastard caste. Uh, mining through uh, rich information on uh, tribes and uh, powerful dynasties in early India, America underlines how many of the castes enlisted by Manu and after as bastard caste were actually uh, powerful tribes. Uh, this is in uh, early Indian uh, uh, history. Uh, what to Ambedkar uh, is Manu's madness is really, uh, he says Manu does not recognize the degree of promiscuity that is implied in his population. Because given the population of the Tagalas, he says it would take uh, for every Brahmin woman to be a mistress of more than one Shudra man. Uh, so, in a sense, that is where uh, the madness of Manu really uh, uh, lies. Uh, in Vision 19, he, uh, uh, which is uh, titled uh, The Shift from Paternity to Maternity, what did the Brahmin wish to gain by it? Uh, Ambedkar, in, the, uh, in uh, uh, unraveling this vision, puts forth uh, before us. Uh, he takes us through the eight forms of marriage and 13 uh, kinds of sons recognized by uh, the Hindu law books, uh, arguing in the process how many forms of marriage were only euphemisms for gay 
and then uh, draw, uh, draws attention to what he says has for long gone unnoticed. Uh, and what has gone for long unnoticed is he says a shift that Manu brings about uh, from Pitu Savarnia to Matu Savarnia, suggesting that uh, Manu enjoins that children born to a woman more than one varna lower than that of the man who take on the mother's varna of the matru savarna. Uh, in a sense, uh, the riddle he says is, why would the Shetra Shetra Nyai, in a patriarchal society where the earnings of the son belong to the father, would a shift from paternity to maternity be brought about? What is the Brahmin wish to gain from it? When one reads this along with the riddle that Ambedkar also writes as riddle of uh, woman, but which uh, is published in the volume as uh, Woman and Counter Revolution, uh, he begins by uh, saying, Manu is not known to be any kinder to women than he was to the Shudras, and ends, in a, ends the riddle uh, by discussing how for Manu, it was the woman's readiness to marry the Shudra, quote unquote, that had led uh, to the downgradation of the sisters. When these three riddles and Ambedkar's unravelling of these three riddles is read together, in a sense, Ambedkar is underlining how Anuloma allowed for a certain amount of flexibility, however limited, within the caste system, in the sense that, in principle, at least, it allows for a composite caste community to exist. But uh, with the shift from fraternity to maternity, the, uh, the, the uh, denunciation of Tatiloma is combined with Anuloma, combined with maternity, must, uh, the child to take on the uh, uh, mother's uh, varna in a sense to ensure complete enclosure of the system. So what he therefore formulates or puts out is the way in which differential rules of mating and lineage structure graded violence in, uh, which becomes a way of organizing the caste system. In a sense, uh, he underlines how differential rules operate in ways such that stringent sexual control on women become the reserve of the privileged caste, while in many ways um, carving out spaces for enforced cohabitation with women of the subjugated caste. And when read this way, one would want to revisit, which for the want of time I will lead to discussion, here, uh, uh, a lot of uh, feminist criticism that has sometimes come on Ambedkar's speech to Devdasi and Aradi at Kamatipura in 1936, which feminists have read as a, uh, uh, as a moralistic uh, approach uh, since Ambedkar asked Devdasi to give up the disgraceful profession and also suggest marriage as a possibility. Uh, so we could bring that up for discussion because this uh, uh, speech which comes before he writes the riddle, in a sense one can see a connection that Ambedkar is making on the graded character of sexual violence in the speech that he delivers at Samadhipura in 1936. Uh, to turn to the uh, last middle the riddle of Ram and Krishna, it is definitely a feminist classic, not just because of uh, the arguments and counter arguments it generated and the rioting uh, and protests that it generated in Maharashtra in the late 1980s, but uh, also because uh, of the centrality of gender in Ambedkar's critique of the heroes of the epic. Ambedkar's strategy of reading uh, the epic also, in a sense, suggests subversion of tradition because he argues for reading the epic as an amalgamation of several traditions. And he goes on. Uh, uh, in a sense, to break the myth of uh, uh, marriage as a sacrament by underlining the gods as unworthy and unfaithful husbands. Uh, 
undermining how both Ram and Krishna really deploy women for power, uh, pleasure and honor, he delivers a double blow in a sense. At one level, it breaks the sacred myth of marriage and at another, uh, importantly, it, he seeks to underline how the personal sphere of no one, not even the world, is about to seek. Something that he wants to take up much more in detail in drafting of the uh, Hindu code bill, where uh, he seeks a democratization of the personal sphere. By his own admission, it was a text which was neither radical nor revolutionary and yet met with immense opposition, so that again to quote him, it died an uh, unsung and un, uh, 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 unsung death. Uh, in many ways, therefore, a question for us to pursue is, what was it in the draft of the Hindu code bill, in its original form, that posed a challenge to the principles of grammatical patriarchy, some of which Ambedkar had laid out in his earlier writings and which I uh, have tried to present uh, before you. Uh, to uh, end, I will just take a couple of minutes to pull together uh, some of the things that are presented, uh, in, uh, uh, presented before you. Firstly, in making a case for claiming some of Ambedkar's uh, writings and speeches as feminist classics and nowhere suggesting that these are sacrosanct texts. In fact, classics are texts that are fluid, which have a persuasive force over time and lend themselves to debate from conflicting and complementary perspectives. And therefore, Ambedkar's writings emerge as classics, both through their authorial brilliance, but also through contemporary interpretative appropriation. Secondly and importantly, uh, in the context of, uh, in our present context of uh, the debate that followed uh, the Ambedkar cartoon uh, controversy, the NCRT book, uh, some feminist uh, voices also uh, uh, suggested uh, that uh, in many ways in this debate that Dalits uh, are excessively emotional or lack rational grasp of uh, history. In this context, I particularly want to underline the uh, rational critical and uh, rational criticality and social imagination in the booklet and music culture that actually allows for an, uh, uh, allows for a reclamation of uh, feminist fundamentals to suggest that probably we need much more sustained and deeper engagement with the heterogeneous and confusing meanings that are generated in diverse communities of meaning before we reach to quick conclusions. A related issue that came up in this debate and is extremely important when we are discussing communities of meaning and anti caste feminist theories and a question uh, that came up because uh, there was uh, a lot of discussion uh, again in feminist circles as well to outside of the hurt produced by the politics of naming caste location. Uh, in many ways an important question that Anu Ramdas asked uh, in her writing on Sabri, uh, a question extremely important to anti-caste feminist theory, can we debate caste without debating uh, the caste location of the debater? This is a question with which anti-caste feminist theory will have to engage because in many ways for feminists, we have for long recognized the epistemic and political significance of identity uh, while also recognizing that identity is very non-essential and radically historical. And therefore this is a question uh, uh, bringing the politics of uh, Naming caste location is not something that we can escape or should try to escape is what I am suggesting. Because if we admit that communities of meaning are constituted through a complex of identity, uh, cultural identity, social location, experience and political position, then in many ways 
it is important to name the social location so that however conflictual or however painful or hurt producing it becomes extremely important to interrogate and discuss the social embeddedness of different groups play and that is what i have tried to in a sense uh, bring out through uh, the engagement ongoing engagement uh, with uh, in booklet and uh, musical uh, meaning uh, communities of meaning and uh, finally uh, what i am suggesting therefore is that it is only for anti war feminist theory it is only through engagement between very diverse communities of meaning that uh, that we can produce the generative structure in which alliances between dalit feminists non dalit feminists dalit anti caste group that has a vision for literary politics can be forged both inside and outside the academy and to end on a note of social location itself uh, i would like to submit in the end that uh, ever since ambedkar speech at mahar to women uh, Dalit women, Dalit feminists, have for long reclaimed his writings and speeches to rewrite the history of and futures of feminism and anti-caste politics in India. The full potential of a feminist Ambedkar remains to be recognized by Dalit male activists and intellectuals and non-Dalit feminists. This presentation is a very limited effort. in that direction by a non-dialectic. Thank you.